the most in-depth coverage of the silver and black as they set their sights on Las Vegas for 2020. Live from the CBS Sports Radio 1140 studios, it's silver and black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. Now, here's Scott Gilbranson. All right, welcome back to the silver and black today here on CBS Sports Radio. Um, I am your host, Scott Branson, founder and publisher of SilverAndBlackToday.com. And we have a happy occasion to celebrate today. We'll get to that in just a minute. But first, some bad news. Uh, every week as we come on the air, the great booming voice that you hear here on um, CBS Sports Radio, uh, voiceover legend Chris Corley. That's the voice of the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio. And when I say he's a legend, I'm not using that term loosely. Chris Corley is a legend in the world of voiceover work. And this week we lost Chris to pancreatic cancer at the very young age of just 55 years old. Um, Over a 36-year career, Corley has been the voice of Fox, Major League Baseball, the Discovery Channel, Nickelodeon, and the Broadway show and tour of the Book of Mormon. Not to mention being an on-air talent in some of America's uh, biggest markets. Just a massive loss for all of us and the world of radio voiceover. And we want to dedicate this show to him and send our deepest condolences to his son, Christopher. Uh, I'm proud he'll continue to be the voice of the Silver and Black today here until we absolutely have to change it. Chris, thank you for your talent and work, and you will be sorely missed. There's no question about that. So, um, again, Chris Corley, voice here on Silver and Black today. Uh, We'll miss him, and uh, certainly his work will survive. Okay, back to the subject at hand, and that, of course, is Raiders football. And as always... I'm joined by my somewhat new and improved team of co-hosts, contributor and NFL draft analyst for silverandblacktoday.com, Kelly Kreiner, and former longtime Los Angeles Lakers scout and NFL aficionado, Chaz Osborne. Welcome, guys. Everybody, Kelly, 4-0. Today is your 40th birthday. Yesterday is your 40th birthday. Yesterday, yeah. That's right. So are you feeling every bit of, of 40? I am right now, but that's got nothing to do with the age. <laughs> it's all the shots. Yeah, so no, no. Kelly, no, I, I worked last night. I went home. I went straight to bed. I had the most boring 40th birthday possible. Oh, man. <laughs> that's not good. Make I, something up for the show. Oh, <laughs> That's right. Do something, man. Come on. Uh, but, but Kelly, happy 40th birthday, man. And uh, we certainly appreciate you being here. Uh, not feeling at, on top of your game, but he will bring his A game because he's a gamer. Play like a champion. Which I'm one? wondering, how much hate mail did Kelly get after his um, bold NCAA prediction last week? I, I don't know. Did you get any hate mail, man? I I didn't see anything, but um, I think we saw that Murray State was, in fact, a fraud when they got boat raced by Florida State. Like, it was, like, I mean, it was embarrassing. Yep. Well, um, that was the problem. The show, uh, we got cut off 15 minutes early because of the basketball, so they didn't get to hear your whole spiel about if they do win the first game, you know, double down on them in the second game. Well, I mean, that's a given. Yeah. Yeah, that's, you know, if you bet sports, that's how it is. If you've got an inkling of something, if you're wrong the first time, you're not going to be wrong again. I mean, <laughs> never. Yeah. I mean, you're right 51% so you, so you're, of the time. You're only wrong once every 90 times? Or what, what is the, <laughs> what's the statistics for you? Well, if uh, you're wrong, you just keep doubling up. It's just 50 50 is all you really need. <laughs> oh, that makes sense. Okay. Well, you, you just factor in the juice. You don't make your bet. I mean, it, it, all, it all works out. <laughs> Sixty percent of the time, it works every time. <laughs> oh my gosh, that, that doesn't even make sense. All right, well, <laughs> what, what we're going to do? Uh, let me run through what's on the show. Uh, reminder: We're streaming today's show worldwide on the Radio dot com app. Uh, if you don't have the Radio dot com app, you're missing out. Make sure you download it. You can always listen to us no matter where you're at. Uh, all great stations from around the country there. Download it and listen to us live anywhere in the world. Also. As usual, we're live, uh, maybe to the chagrin of uh, Kelly today. We're live on video. You can come right in the studio with us. The Tres Lobos. Are we three, three bad camera. wolves? Tres Lobos. See, sí. you'll huff and you'll puff. Mm. Uh, we're I, thought live. Was, I thought you were going three amigos for a second there. I used that one last week. Yeah. I'm trying to switch it up a little bit. I don't, All right, I don't so we... <laughs> <laughs> YouTube, Facebook, Twitter via Periscope, and on Twitch, as always, great listener viewer chat happening there. So join Raider Nation from around the world on our video simulcast. In addition, make sure to read the website that started this all, silverandblacktoday.com. Lots of transactional news this week. It's all on the All Raiders website, the only one based here in Las Vegas, silverandblacktoday.com. Okay, let's set topics on the table now for today's show. 
just so you know what's coming ahead. The Raiders spending free agency in uh, in spending spree. Pa, pa, pa. Somebody hit me in the head. All right. Bam. Thank you. Um, continues slew of signings this week. We'll get into some of them in depth later on in the show. But this week, uh, your future Las Vegas NFL team signed uh, a beast of a linebacker and former Bengal Vontae's perfect. We're going to talk about him in the next segment. Oh, I said segment. I owe a dollar. Resign, uh, resign long snapper Trent Sieg. They also signed former Lions slot cornerback Nevin Lawson. Chiefs offensive lineman Jordan Devey, which will add some depth to that line and also versatility because he can play center. Signed quarterback. This is the one I know everyone was really excited about. Journeyman Mike Glennon is now the backup to Derek Carr, at least compete for it. And they also signed Giants safety Curtis Riley on Friday. Everyone got all that? Most Raider fans, because they are rabid, they already know this and, and we're tracking it all week, but we're going to talk about it. Uh, the Raiders continue to stock players ahead of next month's amateur draft, so we'll see what's going on there. Guest today in our first hour, X's and O's guy, senior NFL analyst for SilverandBlackToday.com, Chris Reed will be with us to break down the player that Vontae's perfect is today and what that means for the Raiders and Paul Gunther's defense and more. Chris will talk with us about the Raiders' other signees as well. In the second hour, we'll talk Raiders uh, where they stand as far as the odds go uh that's right as their uh, agent uh free agent activity continued we'll talk to win las vegas race and sports director doug castaneda he'll give us an overview and talk with him about the growing world of legal sports wagering here in the united states and but we'll get the updated odds on the raiders guys see if they've changed for the better better for the the better better for the better better for the better or better for the yeah. anyway because the raiders have been so busy the silver and black today crew has a ton to talk about we'll start with the biggest signing, as I said, but we'll move our way down. We'll break down what the Raiders still ne- might need to address in free agency, <clears throat> a pass rusher, and what it'll do to their draft board. So much to talk about. We will spend enough time to do that with you guys. We'll also give you an update on the progress and construction of the Raiders' new stadium here in Las Vegas. Those this week, uh, uh, they, they tell you the truth about what's going on here in Las Vegas versus some of the erroneous reports you are seeing about the palace on Dean Martin Drive calling it the palace on d martin drive Erroneous. um so stay around for that and birthday boy kelly kreiner has his kelly's corner we have no idea what he's going to talk about he may mumble and not make much sense but that's okay it's the wild card part of the show so we'll do that also important part of every show is your opinion call be the fourth host 702-889-5978 give us your view just about anything raiders related again call us 702-889-5978 be patient We'll get to you as soon as we can. If the phone rings, don't worry. We'll pick it up. Our crack engineer, David Stepanian, is there. He will pick up the phone and get you on there. There you have it, Raider Nation. You're up to date. We've set topics on the table. Now it's your turn, 702-889-5978. Okay, guys, so uh, busy week, and we're going to get all into that here shortly. Um, but uh, it's, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked at, at Raider fans still – really obsessed with the perfect signing like it happened it seemed like most people were excited about it but now i'm also seeing a lot of people who just didn't like the move well i guess there's a lot of red flags around in the guy right is that the concern <laughs> that, is that that, is that could that, be an understatement is that putting it lightly yeah. I, I know um it was he's best known for his hits on defenseless receivers um one of which we just signed to a big contract after trading for. And apparently no hard feelings there, right? We'll oh, see. hey, they're teammates now, man. They're good to go. We'll see how that plays out. Also, um, you know, how many unsportsmanlike conduct penalties he's had and a few other degenerate plays. You know, Jack Tatum would just call that another day at the office. So so what you're saying is he's the perfect Raider, right? I mean, so that that's what we're going to talk about, though, and I know we're going to talk to um, – uh, Chris Reed, our senior NFL on us next about it. But here's my question is, and 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 we talked about a little bit before he got signed, uh, Jay Burroughs, who writes for our website now and then, um, said, uh, was Raider Nation getting soft because they didn't want this guy? Um, and then, of course, you had the Antonio Brown stuff this week, and could they patch it, which I think is ridiculous. When you're a competitor, you want to kill each other, you want to rip each other's throat out. When you get on the same team, uh, you put that aside. It doesn't mean you might go have – have a beer with the guy right but you put it aside because you're on the same team you're about to join exactly uh, but I, I you know we'll see we'll see how it goes kelly uh any thoughts over there well no i mean i just the second they were mentioning perfect you knew that was going to pop up because it was such a big deal last year 
I mean, he has been in the past a great linebacker. You know, you're not exactly sure what he has left, but I mean, he's still he's still better at the position than anybody else the Raiders have right now. So yeah. I mean, it is an upgrade. But like you said, there are a lot of penalties. There are a lot. I mean, a lot of you know attitude issues or whatever. But yeah. if you win, no one cares. Yeah, that's right. Well, he was suspended at the start of each of the last three seasons, right? Three games, three games, and then he was just four four games, the first four games of last season. See, he's not suspended well, yet this year, so he's starting off better. <laughs> he's already on the right foot. And, uh, and multiple concussions, I know that's a concern. But the guy hits like a Mack truck. I mean, he just brings it. And, and I think I, I understand all of the, the new rules of player safety, and I agree with that 100%. But, you know, he's, he can still bring the mentality. And, and I think that's why Gruden signed off on it. This guy just brings that mentality. I, you know, I'm hearing the comparisons to Bill Romanowski. He's got that, you know, edge, maybe a little dirtiness. And that's, that's old school Raiders. I know we like that. He was signed 20, less than 24 hours after he was released. So yeah. they, they wanted well, it, this guy. It, they did. And, and, and from every indication, we, 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 we knew Paul Gunther was trying to get him even last year. At least that's what we've heard. All right. So we're going to take our first break. On the other side of this break, folks, we're going to be joined by Chris Reed, senior NFL analyst for silverandblacktoday.com. He's going to break down the perfect signing. Was it the perfect fit? Mm-hmm. Or could there be signs that he's on the downslide? <laughs> We will uh, certainly find out here as we uh, go along. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. This is Silver and Black today, live on CBS Sports Radio, 1140. Here's your host, Scott Gulbranson. All right, welcome back to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140. Thank you so much for spending your Sunday with us. And we are talking... Raiders football, and specifically, now we're going to be talking about, starting with, Vontae's perfect. Okay, big signing for the Raiders at linebacker. Huge need for them uh, after last year, and a guy who's used to Paul Gunther's system because he played for him in Cincinnati. Uh, And to talk about this, we go down to Arizona, and we bring in our own Chris Reed, silverandblacktoday.com's senior NFL analyst. Chris, how you doing on this Sunday, man? Good. Summer's almost here. Yes, man. I know. Well, and, and, and for those of us who live in the desert, you know what that means, but I, I'm ready for it, man. We had a, I don't know about you down there, we had a, a late and cold winter as you saw the snow and all that jazz, uh, but uh, now it's getting warm. It's going to be 73 degrees today. I love it, man. I just wish it could last like a couple months. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get to the subject at hand. Vontae's perfect. You did a great piece up on silverandblacktoday.com. You're your very popular The Breakdown series. Uh, and despite his suspensions and some of the off-the-field stuff, um, uh, he has been a, a really steady linebacker. Talk about, in your view, number one, even with what happened last year with some of his injuries and his suspensions, what does he bring to this team that they really, really needed? Uh, a guy that can step in and start that's familiar with the system and, and has performed well in the past. Uh, the real question with him, you know, like you said, is he going to be on the field? Because he's only played in 17 of the last 32 games for his teams, you know. And his suspensions, you almost think they're going to get rid of a coin toss, bring the rest out, and just throw a flag before the start <laughs> of the game now that he's signed with the Raiders. Well, and that, Chris, I mean, that clearly, and I don't, I don't, I don't disagree with anybody who thinks that that, um, that is not something that you want to be concerned about because he's had a history of it, right? Uh, at the same time, you have a defense, right, that's in, in, in sorely needs kind of, I think, a little bit of an edge. Um, what When you look back at the film and you look at all of the different penalties and things he's had, how many of them were, quote, unquote, more dirty versus just being a really nasty football player? I mean, if you think back to the, the Raiders in the 70s, the guy, you wouldn't even hear about him getting, you know, flagged and penalized. It's just the, right. the player safety stuff coming into it. He's a guy that plays the game hard, and, and sometimes you're going to get those, those, like, unnecessary penalties. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oops, uh, I agree. Hey, Chris, Chaz here. So, you know, you, we always hear Mike Mayock talking about the fit. That's their new thing. And we know he, he played under Gunther's system. But as a locker room guy, how do you think he fits? Uh, 
he's he's a guy that's going to hold people accountable for sure. He doesn't seem like he's somebody that's going to you know back away. I, I'd say he's going to help the the young guys, and then you know he'll either fit in or he'll he'll get shipped out. He's on a one year prove it deal, but I don't think he'll be an issue in the locker room at all. I've never heard of him having issues with his teammates before. Yeah, we got. I mean, with that price, we we, uh, we couldn't turn down that deal. Um, how about his uh, against the rush, against the pass? Something better there. Which one? What was that? Is he better against the rush? Is he better against the pass? Uh, he could. I've seen some of him doing, you know, pretty well on both, especially with Gunther's system asking him to kind of drop into his own and then react from there. He showed that he had good, you know, reaction time, good athleticism, getting to the ball in the run game. He was able to stand up blockers, shed them, get you know, and get the ball carrier on the ground. Considering what the Raiders have had at linebacker in, in recent years, you'd have to say it's an upgrade. Doesn't mean he's going to be a pro bowler. Not every, you know, signing is an all pro. Um, you know, he's in that kind of solid starter kind of range. Yeah. Well, the one thing I notice is the way he hits. I mean, he just, he flat out hits the hits the guy. I mean, these guys, are the defensive players are taught from a young age, just go after the ball and hit him. And, uh, he does it. He does it uh, with with violence. Yeah, and 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 uh, Chris, I know when you look at at what he does, you you talked about his athletic ability, and that has never been in question. Uh, but really, his field awareness. Talk about how that helps him really uh, in space and in that double A alignment you talk about in your piece in Gunther's system. How that makes such a big difference for a guy like him. Well, the. the- the game I highlighted was against uh, Tyrod Taylor. You know, everybody knows he's such a mobile guy. And, and his ability to drop, uh, read the route combinations, and then come off the route combinations and rally to the ball when uh, the quarterback was coming out of the pocket, uh, that's that really stood out to me, just the way he could process so much information so quick. Because a uh, linebacker position – uh, you need like a microprocessor in your head. I, I don't know how those guys sometimes with all the RPOs and play actions, uh, you know, how they don't just trip over their own feet sometimes. Yeah, he did a really good job in that. Now, if you look at his numbers, um, and I'm looking up on PFF, and, and, and last year, obviously, injury and, and uh, suspension and whatnot was uh, st- statistically sort of his anomaly year. But you look at since uh, 16 where he kind of peaked – uh, from a PFF grade perspective, and I know that's only one aspect, uh, then it was down uh, two years consecutively. Is there anything you've seen in the tape that makes you uh, concerned with uh, decline in ability, or do you feel like it's pretty much on par the where it's been the last few years? Well, he's he's only 28, so I wouldn't get too worried about you know the age thing. And he, he really talked about how he felt like he lost his soul last year not being with Gunther. So you can you can kind of look at it however you choose to. You can say that's him on the decline, or you can say, you know, he, he lost the coach in a system that he was really comfortable with, and now he'll get it back. It's something that we're going to have to see play out over the course of the season. We, we see a lot of, in basketball, I see a lot of guys, I guess Dwayne Wade would be a perfect example because his nickname was Crash, but, you know, he goes to the glass, he goes hard, and, and later in their career, they, they kind of turn into a jump shooter and, little more finesse is that something that we could see here do we see that a lot in the nfl where players kind of adjust their game as they get older uh you could say that with like a maybe a wide receiver or something where they're going to start relying more on technique but i don't think perfect knows how to play the game any different than (laughs) just to be a 200 mile an hour train he's only got one gear well, yeah. that that makes. I mean, to me, that that w- that's what makes him who he is, and and why he made so much sense for the Raiders, and I think a, a good sign. I mean, that's my view. Hey, Chris, it's Kelly here. I've got a question. If like if Gunther isn't the defensive coordinator for the Raiders, is this a signing that the Raiders are going to go out and make, or is this one that uh, Gunther was really pushing for because it is his guy? He has had him before. Uh, well, Burfick talked about the minute he got cut, he called his mom and then he called Gunther. So I'm sure <laughs> Gunther was kind of the go-between with Gruden. But Gruden also had Bill Romanowski, who uh, I, I, I would say you could put as in even more of a wild card than, than Burfick. So yeah. I don't think you know Gruden would necessarily shy away from it, but he probably wouldn't have had the ease getting getting signed that he did without Gunther being there.
Yeah, there's no question. And, and the fit, knowing that defense, you know, last year, Chris, at this time, we were talking about the Raiders signing some free agents that, that we talked about from the perspective of, hey, this is a guy who's going to come in and lead the young, the young players and show them the ropes. Um, with Perfect, you have a guy who, who's, who's played in that system his entire career, uh, but still has the athletic ability to make an even bigger difference. I think to me, you know, anybody who looks at the signing and thinks, well, he's, you know, maybe he's going to make it, maybe he's not. I've, I've seen people think, well, geez, will he make the 50? I, he's going to make the 53 man roster. I have no question about that unless something happens from an injury perspective. Uh, but um, to me, that's the thing. You talked about it. 28 years old, Chris, a lot left in the tank. Yeah, and I mean, the the best way to show young guys how to play in a system, you have to be able to play in the system. You know, they're not going to listen to a player just sitting on the sideline going, you need to do it like that. You know, you you got to be out there and you've got to show them, you know, what you're talking about. And he, he can certainly start and he can certainly play. So Now, of the other signings, let's get your thoughts a little bit. Uh, we look at Nevin Lawson, the cornerback they signed from the – Lions, Chris, uh, a slot cornerback. Uh, how do you, how does he look? Um, uh, you know, there's been mixed reaction to some of it. I think a good, solid signing for him. What have you seen so far from him? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are going to point out that he hasn't had any interceptions in his five years, but he has put up, you know, 205 tackles. He's got a sack. Um, from a technique standpoint, I, I think that's what he has to clean up. I kind of expected to see like a DJ Hayden, you know, a guy that could stay in phase but wasn't looking for the ball. Um, he did get his head around. He did get his hands on passes. But you can see, uh, especially his press technique, where he, there's a lot he can clean up. But of all the signing, I, I'd say he's the guy that could kind of push for a starting role more than, you know, the rest, except maybe Joyner. You know, they're they're probably looking at him like a Marcus Gilchrist, you know, to play that nickel corner. Yeah, and then one of the other interesting signings to me, and I know some Raider fans don't like it because he, he's from the Chiefs, <laughs> but uh, uh, Jordan Devey, I, I like this kid, uh, played, tried to play through a uh, pectoral tear last year before he got IR'd, uh, but not only does he play um, uh, at uh, tackle, but he can also play at center. So you get a little bit of not only depth, but versatility there. Yeah, that's the, the kind of Feliciano, uh, you know, signing there where the, you need that guy that with the limited number of people you have active on game day that can play anywhere along the line. And that whole, you know, playing all five positions, that's, that's a really rare talent. Absolutely. All right. Chris Reed, Senior NFL Analyst with SilverAndBlackToday.com. Chris, man, thanks, man. Have a great week. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, you too, guys. All right. You're listening to Silver and Black Today here on CBS Sports Radio. Don't go anywhere. We're here with Chuck, founder of Dollar Loan Center. Is it true that mostly low-income people use Dollar Loan Center? Meta Broadcasters Association and this station. CBS Sports Radio. Help us talk the silver and black. Call us at 702-889-5978. Here's Scott Gulbranson on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. All right, welcome back, everybody, to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140. And we're going to continue our conversation that we started with Chris on free agents. Um, And if you look at, guys, if you look at what the Raiders have done in free agency, I mean, clearly they have been very active. Um, they have, uh, I think, turned a lot of heads. They've been sort of, if you look at a lot, a lot of the lists out there, and, of course, the media at this time of the year, a lot of stuff um, you don't have games to report on. You don't have anything on the field happening. So you have to do all the player personnel stuff. Guys, they, the Raiders have, are viewed as kind of being one of the teams that was most active, but not just most active, but successful in addressing their needs. Uh, and we talked about perfect. We talked about Lawson. We talked about... Uh, DV and even Mike Glennon, the quarterback, uh, and now Curtis Riley, another safety. When you guys look at who they've signed thus far, what big need uh, do you think still out there that they want to at least bring some bodies in? Well, for me, it's obvious pass rusher and running back because we have no idea what we have at either position really right now. Well, we know we don't have anything at pass rusher, but I mean running back, we're not even sure what we have. Uh, pass rush is something that the draft is full of running back. There are a ton of running backs, but you are not in a hurry to run up and draft any of them. So I assumed 
free agency was where the Raiders were going to try to address this, but they've they've really made I mean they've really made no moves towards anybody. There's not any rumors about people coming in. There's not any speculation, so they've kind of just left it dry. Yeah, well, you know they're probably going to patch a lot of that together with the draft. You're going to get best available there. You know the one the one signing that we haven't talked about, and this guy Dwayne Harris last year. He made two of the smartest plays on special teams I, I've ever seen. When he, I was watching the games when he did it, and I'm thinking, no, what, what are you doing? The, the game against the Chiefs where they he kicked the ball, and he stepped out of bounds and grabbed the ball on the one-yard line. Everybody's doing that now, though. That's like the new hotness. It's like, I didn't yeah, know. Yeah, it's yeah. The, it's the, the, the fad. I didn't yeah. know that was the rule. I thought he yeah. just made a boneheaded play. Now we got the ball at the one. No, he made the smartest play. We got the ball at the 40. And then that next game um, against the Broncos where they tried to down the punt, and they touched it, but they didn't secure it. He picks it up and goes 99 yards for a touchdown. I didn't know that, that if, if he loses it, since they had already touched it, it would be a dead ball. They can't do anything with it. Oh. Uh, two plays like that, amazing, smart plays. You know, here's a guy under the radar, same thing, a one-year contract. We signed him. He, he, you know, he lent a huge hand and went in the Browns game, too. I remember towards the end of the game, he, he secured a punt. Well, nothing gets you to the Super Bowl like great kick returns. Well, I feel like. It, I mean, if you, can, if you can sign a guy that made two plays last year, you've got to do it. <laughs> Those are genius plays. <laughs> Let me tell you something. Uh, the reason that we got, but, but here's the deal. So, so we look at that from the perspective of, okay, the needs they have. They still have need at linebacker, on, just on the defensive side. You mentioned running back, which absolutely. Defensive end, okay, so the, the edge rusher is still a big deal. Let's look. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw some names at you, people still available, and get your reaction uh, on whether they would f- uh, be a fit. Zach Brown, and linebacker. I'm, I mean, he'd be a fit, but I'm not too excited. <laughs> like it's like the yeah, that's like ooh. Yeah. Well, and then you have uh, Sue is out there, and Dominic and Sue, which not a fit for the Raiders, I don't believe at all. Uh, not only because of uh, uh, the need, but also, but Eric Berry's out there as well at safety. No one he he thought the it looked like he was going to sign in Dallas. That has not happened. Do you take a shot at him, knowing his injuries? I mean, not counting the cancer, and God bless him for, for overcoming that. As a cancer survivor myself, I understand it. But the Achilles is a tough thing to come back from, especially playing that position. Uh, what do you guys think about Eric Berry and giving him a shot? I, I like Eric Berry. We were talking about you know free agents, people that we were going to bring in. Uh, I like high-character players. I like um, you know guys that come in that can change the culture. You know, he, Obviously, he's going to be a cheap, be a one-year kind of thing, two years. Um, he, he's not... 31 till the end of the season. Um, he, he started the Eric Berry Foundation, you know, just all these positive things in the community. Those are the kind of players, now that we've got a couple, you know, talking about perfect being questionable, why don't we go out and get a couple of high-character players? Kelly, what do you think of Barry? The fact that he left Dallas without a contract scares me. Because From a cost da- perspective? Well, not, not only a cost, but maybe also an injury perspective, because if there's a team that needs a safety, like, I mean, there's, there's. I don't think there's a team that needs a safety worse than Dallas right now. So yeah. I mean, if, the fact that yeah, the fact that he got out of there gives me a little bit of you know a little bit of dread that maybe, like I said, he might. I, and I don't think it. We, I don't think it's going to be a money issue as much as an injury issue. And what about what about Adrian Claiborne from the Patriots defensive end? You need rush. You need edge. I know he's not a huge sack guy, but do you do you take a chance? I'm not a big believer in taking somebody the Patriots let walk away, which is why the, <laughs> that's a good point. Which is why the Trent Brown signing is one thing. But I mean, they've shown they can kind of plug in offensive linemen. But I mean, they've basically just let their whole defensive line walk. You yeah, know, Aid, there's a reason they ended up getting him cheap because he did nothing in Tampa Bay. Well, and he, then, had, he had a good week. Yeah, and and the guy too, Ezekiel Anash uh, Ansa Ansa. Yeah, Ansa. Thank you, pronunciation. Uh, from the Lions, here's a guy who got a massive contract, never lived up to it. So he's sort of going to be in a prove it form, or prove it kind of deal, I think, situation, unless he's really going to hold that. Now, again, there hasn't been much interest in him, which is a big concern. Um, any thoughts on him? I'm hearing the injury issue with him is scaring off a lot of people. Yeah, because it's a shoulder. Yeah, and when you've got a defensive lineman who, that's you know. Their arms, shoulders, everything, and that—that that was his thing. He was, you know, the speed rusher had some good moves. He'd throw. He had good speed to power, but I mean, if it's there's a shoulder issue with him, I mean, that cuts down 
big time. Nobody's going to sink it. Because I mean, he he's the top he's the top rusher left. Normally, people are just you know clamoring for a guy like that, and he's probably going to have to take the one year, the one year prove it deal, which he's obviously not willing to do right now. Yep, I got a name Raider fans might remember, um, Benson Moyoa. Uh, he was an undrafted free agent. I uh, played with the Raiders at 14 and 15, and then the Cowboys offered him a three-year, $8 million. The Raiders, um, they did not um, match, it? match that contract. Um, so then the Cowboys let him go. He played for the Cardinals, and he had a, very, he had a really consistent year last year. Um, they're switching. I think the Cardinals are switching to the 3-4 defense, and he, he's, he's primarily played the 4-3 his whole career. So that could be somebody we look at, bring back in. Well, and and what about you talk you talk about Cardinals? What about Trey Boston? That's kind of surprising that he's still out there. Yeah, um, he's. I mean, he's not a, he's not setting the world on fire out there. But like I said, he's super consistent. You know, and that's kind of what you want in a safety. You know, you don't, ever. I, I mean, it looks nice. Oh, he's got you know five six interceptions. Where, but safety's the name of the position. It's like. <laughs> You you want him to not give up big plays. You want to keep things in front of you. You want you know it's you're the last line of defense, and you know he's very good and very consistent at that. Yeah, and and I, last year I think you know he was a free agent last year. He signs with the Cardinals. It was not a great market. It wasn't a very competitive market. So he signed at a pretty low deal. Now he's back on the market. It's a better market, but he doesn't seem to be garnering that much interest. He's only twenty seven years old. And so I, I'm I'm curious as to why um, teams are staying clear. Again, the Cowboys, I, they have a glaring need at safety. It's so big you can see it. Uh, it's bigger than their stadium. Uh, and oh. and nobody nobody seems to want Trey Boston, which I, I don't understand. I watched the guy. I like him a lot. I think his talent level and what he could bring. And the Raiders have already proven they want to bring guys in to compete. Uh, and so the longer he sits out there, the, the I think the more it benefits the team on a deal. Um, just not sure what the deal is. Okay. Yeah, he, he he's gonna. I mean, he's gonna be a guy that he's gonna wind up getting a contract. He's gonna get underpaid. It's gonna be a one year deal. And at the like by, by week ten, we're like, how did this guy go? You know, how did this team get such a good deal on this guy? Yeah, but exactly. it's like last year, no one was paying safeties, and all the talk was about how oh the safeties a position nobody wants to pay for and all that stuff. And then the Redskins go nuts and just throw a Brinks truck at. They Ram. they seem to do that a lot with everything. It, they do. Yeah, I mean they they're not known for spending money wisely in thrifty. free agency. Yeah, um, but that sing, that contract single handedly just skewed the whole safety market. Well, yeah. well, and and one of the sightings that I thought that the Raiders made this week, uh, and it was Friday, is the last one, was Curtis Riley. I like Riley. You, I mean, you you can watch Giant fans talk about how poor he was, and his one big big downside is his tackling ability. Coverage is fine. He had, what, four picks last year. Yeah. Um, I like him as a player. Obviously, the tackling's got to get better. Well, he, um, was, he was third in the team in tackles. Yes, but he would have been was. first if he would have <laughs> <if> he, <laughs> he made them all. By no. a long but, shot. But, no, I know. I know. Sometimes, sometimes guys get a bad rap for a certain part of their game because yep. it is the one part of their game that's glaringly maybe deficient. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, what you, tackling what, people's kind of important. It's, yeah, in, in the game of football, it's a little ah. important. It's not uh, – it's not baseball. So uh, anyway, but good discussion, guys, and we will continue some more of this later. We're going to step aside, and when we come back on the other side of the break, Doug Castaneda, director of the Race and Sportsbook at the Win Las Vegas, will join us. We're going to see if all these free agent moves by the Raiders have changed how Vegas odds look at this team going into next year. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140. Hey, this is Rodney Hudson. You're listening to Silver and Black today. Right. Big center bringing us back in. He just centered me the ball. The radio ball. I love it. Okay. Kelly, you don't look like you're laughing over there. I'm just listening to the cr- <laughs> crickets over here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, as we celebrate Kelly's uh, 40th birthday here on the show, uh, we now are going to switch gears a little bit. We're going to talk everybody's favorite, favorite subject, and it's not just in Las Vegas. Now we can talk. We, can't, we don't have to say for entertainment purposes only because now there's legalized gaming all over, sports gaming, uh, at least in some parts of the country. But Las Vegas will always be the top spot. And we're uh, real excited to bring in now Doug Castaneda. He's the director of the Race and Sportsbook over at the Win Las Vegas. Doug, thanks for joining us early on a Sunday morning, especially when you're busy as all heck for the NCAA tournament. 
Hey guys, how are you? We appreciate you having us on. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for uh, making room on this busy uh, weekend. For us. Appreciate it. <laughs> I know it's uh, it's the ultimate guys weekend in Las Vegas. We've talked about it here, even though we're a, a football show focused on the Raiders. Clearly, a, a big weekend uh, for uh, Las Vegas, and we appreciate everybody coming in. All right, so let's let's talk a little bit. Uh, uh, we're going to look into our uh, crystal ball, Doug, and talk about the Raiders next year. The Raiders have been very active, as have other teams, in free agency this year. Um, their odds, uh, I think, going into the off season, were a hundred and something to one to win the Super Bowl. Have you seen? Have you guys changed your odds based on what the Raiders have done? Not that they're going to be a favorite or anything, but have you changed your odds based on what they've done in the off season? Uh, their chances of winning? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I, I would say uh, that would be an understatement. They have spiraled all the way down to. Uh, pretty low, at least for the last few seasons, twenty-five to one clip. So, wow. like you stated, a hundred to one was uh, what we first hung a week before Super Bowl, roughly uh, this past uh, Super Bowl. So we've had it up for quite some time. It's gradually gone down, and you know, this time of the year, it's all conjecture, perception, and then ultimately signings. And uh, that's what's happened lately. It's it's really gone down to a, a low amount. If you're looking for value on the Raiders, you just missed it by a month. <laughs> um, what about what about other teams uh, it, with the free agency? Uh, clearly, with the Raiders moving uh, down in direction at twenty five to one on your board, uh, who else are you seeing that's ma- made a big change that that uh, that you've noticed and has changed the odds there? I would have to say the Browns. Cleveland Browns have stood out, and more so than the Raiders movement, this was justified by action. So from the get-go, we received money on Cleveland immediately, and that was before the the Beckham acquisition. So uh-huh. when they opened 35-1 to 1, around the same time the Raiders opened 100-1, to 1, they were getting bet on hand over fist. And I think it's because of the Baker Mayfield success. Uh, it, was a, it was a successful season in terms of Browns fans and and people just thought 35 to 1, 30 to 1 was too good to pass up. So uh, they did make early wagers on Cleveland and put us in a hole uh, because, you know, future wagering had just started for us. It, it's barely in its uh, early inception in, in terms of uh, the future book that we take all in all throughout the off season. So we're definitely going to develop uh, a bigger handle as we go. But early on, it seemed to just be all confined on Cleveland. And Right now we stand at eight to one. So uh-huh. around the time uh, you know we opened it up at thirty-five to one, it kind of gradually went down to twenty-two, twenty to one, and that's where it stood pat. Uh, but after the acquisition of of Beckham and and a few other things uh, of note, that, that things are positive in Cleveland right now. You know, the most positive they've ever been, I think, since the Cavs won the the NBA Finals a couple seasons ago. So <laughs> that's dropped down to ten to one and. Uh, Right now we stand at eight to one. So to have the Browns at eight to one, and we're not even amazing. It's not even draft day yet. Uh, is something you don't really don't really say a lot as a bookmaker. Amazing. Again, we're talking to Doug Castaneda, director of the Race and Sportsbook over at the Win Las Vegas. Hey, Doug, it's Kelly Kreiner here. Um, well, one thing: the last time the Browns were favored to win their division, they wound up four and twelve. So this could be very <laughs> good for you guys in the sportsbook. Um, there's there's always been a nice large group of Raider fans out here. Have you noticed? Um, with the Raiders announcing coming to Las Vegas, uh, obviously when they're here in 2020, you're going to see more future wagers on them then. But have you noticed it kind of starting to uptick on just like the casual person putting in, you know, a Raiders Super Bowl future just because the Raiders are going to be a Las Vegas team? Oh, definitely. We're seeing a small play, not substantial play. Um, no matter what the price is, type of play, and you know that's usually accustomed to to good fans. Usually those bets uh, aren't taken as seriously, so don't, we don't really move the money off those type of plays. But we do notice that there's an allegiance. There's a following, and there's people that are backing their hearts with some actual future wagers on the Raiders. So you could see it in town. Um, the town's starting to, to transition into a football town. We weren't really a football town in the past. We, we were as fans. You know, We would flock to our local bars and follow our, our hometown teams because – a lot of people have moved over to Las Vegas from wherever their hometowns are spread out across the country. So there was an allegiance to their hometown fans until now. We're starting to see what the Golden Knights have done. Um, that hometown pride is starting to, to be shown on the NFL 
ledger. So we're starting to see billboards. We're starting to see development. Um, there, there's there's a development going on in Henderson that's attached to the Raiders down at Town Square, um, a really popular uh, centralized location for shopping and dining. Um, has a commitment to excellence headquarters with uh, a pro shop and Lombardi trophies on display. So you're starting to see things that an NFL town have on display, and that kind of legitimizes uh, the transition for people who, like myself, I'm a, I'm a true Raider fan. I grew up in Burbank. Mm-hmm. That's in L.A. So during the 80s when they moved into the Coliseum, uh, I, I became a Raider fan for life. So <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of people here, uh, you know, they bring their allegiance to, you know, with them from wherever they came from. And you're starting to see people who did that with hockey become Golden Knights fans. Oh, yeah. You're seeing that with, with football uh, and the Raiders uh, as the same. Again, we're talking to Doug Castaneda, the uh, director of the Race and Sportsbook over at the Win, my favorite place in all of Las Vegas. If you haven't been there, it's gorgeous. Uh, with about the minute we have left uh, with you today, Doug, tell people what you have going on this weekend. I mean, I know we have one more day and then, of course, the rest of the tournament. And then uh, how how – they find you at the sports book, and and what is it about the Win Race and Sports Book that makes it so special? Well, today we got some some pretty big games. There's some marquee schools going on. It's the uh, kind of the last stanza of of the four day craziness that we have going on here. We had a really fun weekend. We had the Encore Theater opened up for uh, theater style viewing parties uh, with the first second round activity. Uh, we had, of course, our, our Win Sports Book, just fabulous setup. Uh, the layout is incredible, um, luxurious seating. You also have the Encore Sportsbook, too, adjacent to our, our hub here at the Wind Tower. So really good setup. We had three locations you could wager on. And going towards today's schedule, we got some big schools, like I mentioned, Duke and North Carolina, of course, come to mind when you think of college basketball uh, reigning programs, uh, at least since I've been born. All right. Uh, well, Doug, hey, listen, man, thank you so much for joining us, and we're going to have you on again uh, I, as a Raider fan, too. We'll get your perspective on those things as they go along, too. But again, Doug Castaneda, check out the Win Race and Sportsbook this weekend for the NCAA tournament. Thanks, Doug. We'll talk to you again soon, buddy. Thanks a lot, guys. Have a great weekend. All thank right, you, Doug. you, too. All right. All right. We're going to uh, take a break, pay some bills, and when we come back on the other side, we'll be joined by Steve Berman, from the Athletic Bay Area. He'll talk a little bit about what coverage might be like for the Raiders in the Bay Area after they move to Las Vegas. You're listening to Silver and Black today, here only on CBS Sports Radio 1140. With CBS Sports Radio 1140 Studios, it's Silver and Black today. Join the conversation by calling 702-889-5978. Now, here's Scott Gilbranson. Welcome back, everybody, to the Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140 in a beautiful, sunny, 70-degree Las Vegas before our faces start melting off later in the summer. Uh, but we're glad to have the weather. We're glad to have you with us both here on the radio and on our live video feed on all the different channels where you'll find us. So thank you for doing that. We're going to shift gears now. We're going to go back to the Bay Area. Yes, the Raiders are coming to Las Vegas. Yes, it will be their future home. But they still have one more year in Oakland. They also have a rich and important history in the Bay Area, which will never, ever go away. The original Raider fans are in the Bay Area, and that runs deep for a lot of folks. And so it will always be part of the Raiders and uh, uh, of the team moving forward. We now uh, bring with us Steve Berman. He is a contributor at the Athletic Bay Area, also known as the Bay Area sports guy. He founded the most uh, really the most influential and successful independent news site uh, up there as well. So uh, as someone who's doing that here in Las Vegas, Steve, it's good to talk to you, man, and uh, what a great job you did. I'm glad to see how well you're doing. Yeah, it's, uh, thanks for having me on. Yeah, it's uh, amazing uh, with the Raiders. You know, It's the weirdest situation, I think, in professional sports where you, you know, in, in essence, three years before you leave – um, you're saying, hey, we're leaving. Uh, we're moving to a different city, but we're going to play here for a while. Uh, I always talk about it as, you know, you're telling your girlfriend or wife, hey, we're getting, we're splitting up, but I'm going to sleep on the couch for a couple of years. It doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't make a lot of sense. It's been a crazy time. But I, I was really struck by, and it's a question I had in my back of my mind as someone who's in the media, is when the Raiders leave to come to Las Vegas after this season permanently, will the Bay Area media – outlets follow it you wrote a piece about that and um 
Talk about what you found out uh, uh, really off the top, kind of in general, what the answer to that is. Well, uh, I thanks for having me on again. I, I wanted to see because, you know, a lot of uh, there's been a lot of dismissiveness toward the Raiders, especially in uh, recent weeks, because they tried to uh, play anywhere but Oakland. Uh, mm-hmm. So they really wanted to play at AT and T Park, which I guess now is named Oracle Park, which is weird, the, with the, <laughs> the Giants play, and they uh, were rebuffed on that one. The 49ers didn't want them in San Francisco. I don't even really know if the city of San Francisco is really that keen on adding that extra traffic, and so they had to kind of uh, go tail between the legs back to the Coliseum. But then, when they started, uh, you know, acquiring players like Antonio Brown and Trent Brown and uh, and they start, Lamarcus Joyner. All of a sudden, you know, people are starting to talk about the Raiders again. So I was wondering, you know, just like nothing had happened. So I was just wondering if the, you know, maybe the the media was going to keep going after they left Oakland. And I tried asking pretty much everybody I could, and I didn't get a lot of concrete answers. Uh, Las Vegas is actually the place where there's a hub for the Athletic, who I write for, and. So we're going to, you know, the Athletics still going to cover the Raiders when they move to Vegas. Nothing really will change on that one. But the San Francisco Chronicle, I don't think, is going to follow the Raiders. And Bay Area News Group, which uh, the San Jose Mercury News and a bunch of affiliated papers, I don't know if they're going to go either. It, it, I wasn't given a definitive answer, but I don't think so. And I don't really think NBC Sports Bay Area is going to do much. I think what they'll do is probably just uh, cover some of the bigger stories, but I don't think they're going to have a beat writer installed. Uh, in Las Vegas. Yeah, and it, it's it's one of those things where uh, clearly, and, and you and your story talk about, about San Diego and the Chargers, a team I grew up watching, um, and how, how they've kind of handled it. Now, that's a one-team town now, because and, and obviously a lot smaller, uh, because they, they have the Padres, and that's pretty much it. Um, with the Bay Area, you have so many, you have NBA, you have, major league, you have two Major League Baseball teams, you have an NFL team in the 49ers, uh, and and so so there's a lot different uh, atmosphere and a much bigger media market. Uh, but at the end of the day, Steve, I mean, it's it's what the readers want, right? It's what um, if you're a newspaper, you want subscriptions. If you're an online outlet, you want people to click through and see and read your stories. And so, uh, but the, the the thing is, I know there's a lot of Raider fans because we hear from both sides. A lot of Raider fans who are going to write off their team, um, and 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 they're done because they're leaving Oakland. And then there's, of course, the rest of the folks, which I think is probably the vast majority, who will follow them, even some of them begrudgingly, um, as they go to Las Vegas because it's still their team and they grew up in the Bay Area. Even when the team was in L.A., they were fans. So so from that perspective, it's really going to be business that dictates a lot of it for some of those publications, correct? Yeah. I mean, if, if there is actually interest, uh, the thing about newspapers is they want subscriptions more than clicks. So right. they're not sure if it's going to lead to subscriptions going on. However... Uh, yeah, I think if enough people care about it, there'll still be coverage. The uh, San Diego situation is different for a lot of reasons. It's because the Chargers were the number one team in San Diego, and they were only moving about uh, an hour and a half, two hours north, Right. whereas the Raiders are definitely not the number one team in terms of interest in the Bay Area. They kind of squandered a lot of that when they moved to Los Angeles in the 80s and came back in 1995, and it sort of bumbled their way through their second Oakland existence since with uh, a lot of bad teams and a bad decision to uh, stick a what they call Mount Davis on Oakland Coliseum. And uh, so, I'm, you know, I, there's still the 49ers here. I mean, the 49ers grew in popularity after the Raiders left. And then you also have the Warriors and the Giants and the A's So it's in the Sharks. So it's, it's a totally different situation. However, the Raiders fans are a unique group in that, because of their sort of nomadic existence, uh, there is a wide set of them that will follow them really wherever. And I, I don't think that, you know, it's, it's not really a surprise that they're moving. I mean, they've been talking about moving to Vegas or San Antonio or all these other spots for the last uh, several years. Well, it's, again, we're talking to Steve Berman from The Athletic in the Bay Area, also Bay Area sports guy. Um, Steve, the, we get a lot of listeners and folks, and, and we have a lot of comments right now on our Facebook and YouTube feeds. Uh, and we heard this going even last year. You know, when people complain about, quote-unquote, negative coverage, 
to be fair, I dismiss that because, you know, fans want, uh, there's a lot of fans today with the way journalism has changed. A lot of fans want almost fan oriented media where everything's raw, raw. And that's fine. There's outlets to do that. Some of them are very, very good. And I don't have a problem with it. But when it comes to straight journalism, you're going, you're supposed to strive for objectivity. A lot of the fans that we hear, and it's hard for us to know because we're, we're in Las Vegas. They, they feel like as soon as the move was approved that the, the, the coverage overall, and I'm not talking about columnists, but the coverage overall just got negative. I equate that to the fact that the team's been bad. Um, have, you, have you noticed any of that as a guy who watches the media? Have you noticed a shift in tone? I would say a little bit. Uh, I don't know if it's uh, unfair in terms of the discussion of the products on the field because other than uh, the 20 uh, – 17 season, I mean, the team has been just wretched. So, right, right. And, and then, you know, and, and people had a lot higher hopes for the team when John Gruden came, and everyone sort of was confused with the Khalil Mack trade and then the Cooper trade afterwards. Uh, I do think that there are, I see a lot of Raiders fans who get upset, and it's sort of the whole idea of haters and uh, <laughs> anything that's negative, they, they get upset. And that's, that's the way a lot of fans are right now, and uh, and probably always have been. There's just more outlets and more ways for fans to voice their opinions. But I, I, I have noticed uh, ever since it was made official a couple of years back that the Raiders are going to uh, move to Las Vegas that, uh, you know, the, I think the beat writers have kept, uh, you know, completely objective from what I noticed, guys like Vic Taper and Scott Bear and Matt Kalahara and everyone who covers Jerry McDonald. But I, I do think that the overall, you know, the talk show, uh, talk shows around here have gone from uh, minimal Raiders coverage to just about zero Raiders coverage. And a lot of that, I think, is also in part because Mark Davis made the decision to replace Greg Popp with Brent Musburger, right, which right. not only seemed like just sort of a nod to Vegas in general, but also, I mean, objectively speaking, Greg Popp is a much better announcer on the radio doing play-by-play football than Brent Musburger is. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with that. I think... That um, what, what we've seen, too, of course, Michael Gelkin from the paper here, the Las Vegas Review-Journal, you talk about a guy who's been through a journey, covers the Chargers, they move, <laughs> gets, gets the Raider job, and has to live in the Bay Area for a little while, which isn't a bad deal, and then yeah. covering for the Las Vegas paper. So if for him, he's, he's that guy. What, what we've noticed, too, and a lot of the folks um, that are in the media, when you talk to them h- here in Las Vegas now, I'm, I'm speaking because – those of us in mm-hmm. Las Vegas, we don't have anything. We always talk about how much we love the Oakland fans and that we, we feel for them and understand. I have family and friends in San Diego who lost their team, so I understand it from their perspective too, even though it's different circumstances. Um, but th- there's been almost a little bit uh, of a feeling here too, even amongst the media, that the Bay Area media is a little bit of arm's length distance with the Las Vegas media. And even the team has treated Las Vegas media very at arm's length as not to offend the Bay Area media. Isn't that unusual? And have you seen or heard about any of that? I, I really haven't. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that hasn't existed. I'm just not really embedded with the uh, sort of w- what goes on in the media rooms and in the press boxes at the, at the, at the Coliseum to know. Uh, and I haven't heard much from anyone there. I mean, I, I know I one of the people I spoke with uh, for this article, one of the editors I spoke with said that he thought it was a really smart idea to have Michael Gelkin there and bet it with the team for a couple of years. And obviously the Raiders are going there. And I don't, I don't sense a lot of animosity from the fans toward Las Vegas as a city or a market. I, I think that uh, there's been a lot of people who've kind of questioned the amount of public money that went to the stadium because in California, that's pretty much a non-starter at this point. And right. I think I've seen people saying that they kind of feel for the uh, the citizens of Vegas that so much money is going toward this uh, project for Mark Davis. But it's, I, I, I think the people were expect, like I said earlier, people were expecting the Raiders to move somewhere for so long. And I think a lot of actually of the fans are probably happy that it's Vegas and not San Antonio or somewhere farther away. Media wise though, I, you know, it's, it might just be a situation where it's uh, everyone in the Bay area kind of knows each other in the media. It's a, a group that uh, for the most part is pretty friendly and close to each other. And maybe just, you know, this, who, who's this other person here? I don't think there's any jealousy or anything like that. That's no. I've heard, but I could see where it could be sort of, uh, uh, I don't know, provincial. It's definitely a very yeah. provincial market. Bay Area people, you know, in terms of fans and, and media, really only uh, trust the Bay Area people to <laughs> tell them uh, about sports. It's, it's true with talk radio. It's true with 
columnists that it's true across the board. Well, no, and Steve, I think I think too that one of the things that I would say, and and as as a human being, um, you know, I look at those guys up there and 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 girls, and I say, hey, listen, if I'm in their shoes, it's tough because you don't know what happens next. Now, people like Vic and those guys that are that are long time, they're gonna find they're gonna cover something. There's no doubt. Uh, but when your 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 world, you've been an NFL beat writer, and that's gonna change. Um, you know, that creates uncertainty, and and from a personal feeling, it's hard not to keep some personal. Um, uh, skin in the game there, so I totally understand it and, and and can feel for those folks up there because they're not sure what's next, and even if they are, what's sure what's next, it, it's a change, and that's always difficult. So, um, very great though. I, I recommend everybody uh, keep track of Steve and read his stuff there. Uh, Steve, thanks, man, for spending the time with us. I'm sure we'll talk to you again real soon. All right, sounds good. Thanks for having me on. All right, Steve Berman from the Athletic up in the Bay Area. Thanks, Steve. We're going to step aside, and on the other side of the break, we're going to talk about the stadium here in Las Vegas and what you've heard and what you haven't heard about the project. You're listening to Silver and Black today, and search CBS Sports Radio 1140 in Las Vegas, and listen to us anytime, anywhere. Welcome back to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Again, thanks to Steve Berman from the Bay. The Athletic Bay Area, not the Bay Area Athletic. Wow, I'll get it right. Uh, but Steve, give us interesting insight on that because it really is. I think for uh, we do we hear just a ton, guys, uh, from from fans up in the Bay Area, and um, with all due respect to all of you guys that are in the Bay Area, um, I get what you're saying about the coverage not being what you wanted to, and that it's cut back. It's hard to get coverage. You know. To be frank, that's great for us because you're listening to us, so thank you. But at the same time, um, I think some of it is emotional. Some of it, you know, you, 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 uh, with all the different types of media, and I talked about like fan-oriented media, right, which is fan-oriented media has its place, and, and there's some great, fantastic Raiders fan websites and podcasts and all that kind of stuff. But um, I think what that does is for some people, they suddenly want all Homer-type coverage. And we don't do that here. And some people get mad at us eh. for it. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we're homers for Las Vegas. Um, but but overall, I think that it, it's tough. When you're in a city, you follow the team. And, and so many Raider fans are going to be Raider fans if they played on Mars. And so they don't care that they're moving per se. They just want to follow their team. So they get really frustrated by it. Uh, but but at the same time, I think you all have to remember your expectation is they're leaving that market. It's a the media is a business, okay? It's information, yes, but it's a business. We're all in it to make money. Anybody who tells you you're not in it to make money, um, except Chaz, who who said he won't take money to, to nope. do the, no, just kidding. No, um, don't need it. But you know what I'm saying, guys. I mean, it's one of those things where I think they just you have to temper your expectations if you're in the Bay Area and respect the fact that they have to start looking past when the Raiders leave. Well, I think, you know, winning cures everything too. We saw all the Charger fans and how upset, and there's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of hardcore great Charger fans down there. You know, you and I growing up there, I went to that Raider game every year and those, you know, those fans show up. And um, this year, you know, Steve had a great uh, point in his article about the the viewership, how how it was up in San Diego this year, you know, obviously because they're winning. So yeah. When teams are winning, you know, they're going to follow. And uh, the Raiders, you know, after this season, it looked a little bleak. And then now we've got, you know, a ray of hope and things are moving, trending in the right direction. They're going to follow. Yeah, and you mentioned it earlier. Like, it's just a weird situation out there. Yeah. Because you know they're leaving, but they're still here for a couple of years. So there's just that bitterness. That's And that's, I don't care if you're a fan, if you're in the media or anything, you're still a person. That's still going to be, you're going to feel that. You know, that's going to creep into whatever you're doing. You know, Wednesday night I was at a little meet and greet thing for a March Madness party, and a couple guys from Oakland saw I had my silver and black today thing on. They asked if it was a Raiders thing. And, you know, I explained, yeah, it's a radio show, podcast, everything we do. They're like, yeah, we were Ra- we were Raiders fans. Uh. I'm like, so did leave in the Bay Area. He's like, yeah, he goes, we fully understand that in two years we'll be Raiders fans again. He goes, but right now we're not Raiders <laughs> yeah. fans anymore. But, but, but you know what? I mean, Chaz, Chaz mentioned we grew up in San Diego, and it, I talk about it all the time here on the show that as a kid growing up as a Chargers fan, that was my team. As I got older, you know, I, I lived in Kansas City for a while, which made it worse because I, I still hate the Chiefs. Um, but but I, I, got, I grew out of it. I knew they were going to leave. And for me, it wasn't so much about the Chargers as it was about San Diego. Now, Chaz, Chaz grew up with, with, with me in San Diego, but Chaz was always 
you followed the Raiders and were a yeah. Raiders fan. You were like the outlier, like yep. you and 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 uh, a couple other people. Yep. Yeah. So there, there, there was one of those situations where you just like, for me, I just let go. And I became a fan of the game. And now being in a business where we talk about the Raiders and a Raiders website and podcast and all that, I'm objective because I'm not a, I'm not a fan fan. If, if people don't, you know, if people don't follow a team, doesn't make them unwilling or unable to talk about that team. But I think for a lot of people, it is it is geographical. So if yep. you're if you really are that strong and I could understand a fan saying, you know, I'm done. They've left twice now. So I'm done. I get it. Uh, and I don't fault them for it because I did the same thing. No, I think, you know, the Raiders driving two hours to Los Angeles, not a problem for, for me and, and my friends, my group of Raider fans. Um Think about, like you said, geographically, people in St. Louis, they, you know, they lost two teams as well. They can't go all the to way the west up coast. to the West Coast. Yeah. So moving to Las Vegas, you might hear some fans, like Kelly said, you know, yeah, they're a little bit upset they're moving, but they're coming to Las Vegas, and everybody wants an excuse to go to Vegas, and you're going to follow your team. That's, that's not very difficult to get to. And even when, when uh, the Raiders moved to Los Angeles initially, there was a lot of Oakland fans on that Raider shuttle coming down every Sunday to watch the games. So geographically speaking, and then throw Las Vegas fun trip. You know, you're going to make a weekend out of it anyway. It's yeah. it's going to work out. They're going to you're not going to see that much fall off from the fan base. You're going to. I mean, you talked about the travel. I think it's great for the southern, like the L.A. Raider fans. Oh yeah, because it's it's such a quick drive out here for the weekend. And everything. If you're in Oakland, that's not. I mean, it's not something that's easy to do. Like you can plan ahead, you yeah. know, flight and everything. Quick flight. But as far as, uh, you know, but. You know, as far as you're not driving down like eight or nine hours, nah. that's a boring, boring drive to begin with. Yep. But I mean, like, it's, it'd be a little tougher for the Oakland fans, but I mean, for the Southern LA Raider fans, I mean, right. it's a great situation. I mean, if they move to San Antonio, it, we're having a total different conversation, but Vegas, <laughs> right? Absolutely. And, 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 and that's the thing. I think that if, if, even look, watching the chat on uh, YouTube and Facebook right now, people uh, are the same. And um, yeah, here's Angelo, grew up in Kansas City, I was a Raider fan. I can't even imagine that. <laughs> uh, but although I can't, you Chaz, you can because you were. Yeah. There's nobody that that Charger fan. I mean, I grew up hating the Raiders. Yeah. I did. I hey. mean, that's just the you you from from when you're a child. Of course, that's your rival. And the Chargers were never any good. Let's right. face it, except for a few years. So it was like the Dodgers and Padres. You always hated the Dodgers because yep. the Dodgers were always good. Right. And your team wasn't. Yeah. Uh, when you're in a small market like that, and but I got it left and right growing up. You know, oh, you're one of those. Da, 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 you know, yeah. <laughs> and, and so now it's it's so great being in Vegas and having a hometown team that's your team. I mean, I just well, and 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 having Steve on w- was really interesting to me, and and I think I'm going to have him on a on a podcast and do a longer segment because I'm really interested in how the media has changed. I mean, we see it every day. Social media has changed things. The way the media covers things. I mean, I don't. We don't get into politics ever on this show, but the way politics is covered is different. Sports is the same because of the democratization of information, i.e., the web. You can have a fan website and knock it out of the park, make money, do an amazing job, like so many people do. But you're not getting objectivity there. You're getting much more of a fan perspective, and that's awesome. But what about if you're more discerning and you want balance, right? So then you have to look for sources to get that right. and how that's changed. But I think it changes people's expectations. Love to hear what you guys think. 702-889-5978. Um, chime in and tell me what you think about all of that and, and the media, not only in the Bay Area, but in general and how they cover the team. And do you just want people talking positively uh, about things uh, and use words like we and uh, like you're part of the team? Or do you want to hear folks that are, are looking at things kind of more down the middle. It's a, you know, and I think, I think on the, it might depend on the day. You might want to read some really positive stuff and be your fan, and then you might want to go to another source and read some of the great beat writers that they have up in the Bay Area yeah. and, and, and get that different perspective. Uh, well, it's funny. You know, all my travels, I, you know, I'm driving around. I was in different cities you know, on a daily basis, and, and you'd listen to these Homer programs, and it just, it's frustrating because you do want to hear other perspectives. You want to get both sides of the story. But then when it comes to the Raiders, I do just want to be a homer. I only want to hear great news, great things about the Raiders. There's no negativity. We win the Super Bowl every year, and I'm happy. Well, luckily, on the radio, you're not yeah. a fanboy. And, and the problem with it is when you said you're looking for some objectivity, the, it's just one or the other. It's you're either all in on the Raiders, you're all against it. I mean, it's just, that's yeah. just the way it is. It's a love-hate it's, thing. In media markets, there's, no, there, there's so few people that are down the middle to get both sides. It's either 
you know, won or left. And that's not just sports. That's politics. I mean, that's everything now. Oh, yeah. I it's mean, you divide and conquer instead yeah. of just putting everything out there. All right. Well, we're going to step aside. And when we come back, we're going to have... Kelly's Corner will also give you that stadium update I promised you and clear up some misinformation that's out there so that you guys know where everything's at. No, it's not delayed. That's the biggest thing you need to know. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio, 1140 AM. CBS Sports Radio. Hey, this is Tim Brown, Hall of Famer. You're listening to Silver and Black today. Irish. To me. Yeah. Okay. Happy birthday, Mr. President. <laughs> to <laughs> Kelly. <laughs> yes, I cannot sing. I don't try to hide that fact. I don't even sing well in the shower. No. Oh. But today is Kelly's 40th birthday, uh, so it's a very special edition of Kelly's Corner. Um, and Kelly wants to talk about his birthday. And celebrating birthdays in general. This is a wild card segment. It's not always on Raiders. It's not always on football. And uh, we'll uh, we'll let him go. So, Kelly, it's your show, brother. Go. Yeah, like you mentioned, yesterday was my 40th birthday. And uh, all week, everybody's asked me, what are you doing for your birthday? What are you doing for, like, I'm working. <laughs> They're like, oh, you have to do something. It's like, no, I'm not a six-year-old. My birthday's not important. <laughs> and I bring this up to just a little piece of advice. I've worked in bars for... About half of my life now. If you're that group of people that come in on someone's birthday and act like you are a six-year-old at Chuck E. Cheese, everybody that (laughs) works in that establishment hates you. (laughs) From the second you walk in the door, if you're 50 and you have a tiara and a sash on, Mm -hmm. nobody wants to Where's my free drink? It's my birthday. Yeah. And that's the thing. Hey, always ask for something because some places do that. But if they say no, don't act like they just spit in your face because you didn't get something on your special day because you're a 46-year-old adult. There's nothing more annoying than that I, I, if you're working in the bar industry. Somehow I'm picturing like a sex, six-year-old Kelly had a birthday and nobody showed up. <laughs> and so Actually, now he's really, angry. Ever since. he's really angry about it. No, I always had to have my birthdays either earlier or later because it's during spring break when I was ah. in school and I was gone. So you had to have like but a no, week earlier or a week when, late? Yeah. When you're... You know, when you're 18, that's something to celebrate. You know, 21, 21 go out with your one. friends. I always said. After 21, there is absolutely nothing that means anything I to disagree. you as an adult. One, 25, my car insurance went down. Guess what? That doesn't happen as often as, much as it used it to used anymore. To. Well, that that's, see, that, Because that was always the kicker. It's like, yeah. oh, at 25, your insurance is cheaper. <laughs> I've got anymore. some friends who, have, no, didn't change anymore. Wow. So that's not even, yeah, because that was always the moment I always joke about that milestone. But yes. If so, you're so, an adult, your birthday's not important to anybody. So but you don't you. believe that. So you you are having a milestone birthday. Why is it a milestone? Because you're still alive. Well, you could say if you would, you've known me ten years ago, <laughs> you, you could have said that from twenty nine to thirty eight. <laughs> Congratulations. True, but I think there are, I, and maybe it's because life expectancy used to be so short. You know, you go back to the nineteenth century, and people made thirty three was old. Right. right. I mean, if, if you got into your mid 30s, you were old. <laughs> so maybe that's where this kind of celebration. Now, I agree with you on on the premise of your point, because when I see people like I, people that I've worked with over the years, what are you doing? Can I get this day off? Well, why? Well, it's my birthday. It's a Wednesday. So what? Celebrate your birthday on the weekend. I mean, I would give them their days off because they 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 have them. But at the same time, it's like, really, you're doing a whole birthday weekend. The birthday um, month thing, you're the worst person. Who does that? Yeah. Who does that? If Come you on. sit there, it's my birthday month. No, you were born on one day. It's your birthday. Yeah. You're, yeah, you're, you're just the worst person if you want to celebrate your birthday for a whole month. <laughs> the worst person in the world? Who does that segment? I forgot. Um, it was Olbermann, I think it was. Um, okay, well, Kelly, happy birthday. Happy birthday, Kelly. My, my, I have a landmark birthday coming up. Thanks, Dave. Oh, yeah. David, there he is. Um, I have a my fiftieth will be out in November. <laughs> Thanks, Chaz. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. I was but anyway, say the years have not been kind. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, brother. I, I always count on you guys to lift me up. Yep. Um, okay, back to some Raider talk here. What I wanted to do was there's a lot of misinformation and jump to conclusions this week because there was a Stadium Authority Board meeting. 
Uh, you can go and read the story we put up on silverandblacktoday.com, uh, which is stadium on time despite erroneous reports, because they were. And where this all came from, it, this is where social media drives me nuts. I've made a living doing it at big corporations. I've done a lot of work in the area. But it drives me crazy because somebody sees a tweet and instantly, bam, it catches fire, even though there's more to the story. Pro Football Talk, Mike Florio, who Raider fans really dislike because he likes to make fun of the Raiders. Um, he's, Raiders have been easy to make fun of, though, let's be fair. Uh, put out a story saying the Raiders stadium was delayed, oh, albeit four days. We all heard the same report because uh, it was in a report at the stadium meeting. Well, what he didn't report was Rick Volata, who we're going to have on the show next week from the RJ, right after said, well, no, it turns out Don Webb, who heads the project of the stadium, said, no, that was that was some subcontractor put that in. Those are the wrong dates. The date has not changed. It's still delivery, substantial completion, July 31st, 2020. The first game, they said, was August 6th, and now that's in jeopardy. The NFL hasn't made its schedule. You don't know what day the first game is going to be. In fact, you, didn't, you don't even know now what the games are for 2019. You know the schedule, teams, but you don't know the dates. So, again, people jump with this. And then, of course, the people who swear to God that this stadium is not going to be done on time uh, ran with it, too. But I just want to tell you guys, when you see things, just wait and make sure you look for reputable sources. Rick's one of them. We, we, we are there, too. We go to the meetings uh, and are there. So just make sure you do that. The stadium is not delayed. They had some pieces of the stadium delayed, but it's built by design so they can stop one area and start another area uh, without delaying the project. Uh, real quick, though, I want to update you on the finances. So the room tax that funds the stadium here in Las Vegas, um, which was part of the public financing, is uh, 0.6% over projection, so just about projection. And for January, after a really strong uh, end of last year, in fact, if you look at the monthly revenue for the hotel tax in December, which is a traditionally slow month here in Las Vegas, 6.2% over projection, it was just... Uh, uh, under a half percent over projection for January, and that's preliminary numbers. And so overall, if you look at the project, the project is, um, I should say the tax, is about a half a million dollars over what they projected. And that's from March 2017 when they started collecting through the projections for January. So you'll, you'll hear a lot of that. And if you're watching on video, I'm holding up this chart, and I invite you, you can go to the Stadium Authority's website, uh, and you can get all this information, the charts, the videos, all that stuff is on there and you can see it. But guys, no stadium delay. Uh, it, it, it continues to be, I think, people who were against the project, whether they're from Oakland or Vegas. There's a lot of people in Vegas who didn't want it either. Um, I think they're just salty. Yeah. I just find it funny about how when people bring that up, it's like they're attacking Las Vegas. Like the city of Las Vegas is building this. Stadium. <laughs> like the city of Las Vegas isn't building this. It's just being built in the city. Right. Well, no, I think I think that's true. I think some of that is like civic pride. That's where I talked about being a Las Vegas fan because I was at an event at the stadium site, and 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 the the guy who's the head of Cox Communications for all of the United States came. Oh, how long have you been a Raider fan? I said, Well, I'm not a Raider fan. I'm a fan of the Raiders doing well in Las Vegas. If that makes sense, it does. Uh, and uh, he kind of was taken aback by it and said, "Oh." oh that makes sense. Oh, so it's, it's business. And I said, yeah, it's business, but it's my hometown now in Las Vegas. I want them to do well. We're all investing money in it. So let's, let's, let's hope the stadium does well. It's going to also bring other things to the market. Yep. But um, I mean, the stuff you see on the internet and I've gotten, I've gotten fooled. I mean, anybody here not been fooled by some link, you click on it. Now I'm much more skeptical on everything I see. So I wait, but uh, that trap is so easy to fall into. I don't believe anything I read on the internet, but I still read it because I have ample free time. <laughs> fake, <so. laughs> fake, fake news. Yeah, the, the whole fake news thing. Uh, no, we're going to go now to uh, one of our favorite guys here in the Las Vegas Valley, and that is our caller, Wally. Wally, you're on Silver and Black today. How you doing, my friend? Hey, Golly, what's going on? Oh, just grinding it out, man. How you doing? Hey, good. I got a couple things. Uh, for one... After your 21, birthdays are for kids. There you go. Okay. Thank you. And for two, you. when uh, the Raiders moved the first time to L.A., I was working for Hughes Aircraft in Tucson, and I tried to quit them. I couldn't do it, so 
so finally I just wouldn't let my girlfriend buy me anything that said L.A. Raiders. Just ah. had to be just straight Raiders. So that's how I dealt with that. And then uh, what are those big black things at the stadium? Are those roof supports? Could you find that out for me? Yeah, there, there's some uh, roof trusses there as well. Uh, and then if you drive down Dean Martin, it's kind of cool. If you, if, you, if you drive down Dean Martin, as you get towards the south end of the site where all the trailers are, there's actually – panels part of the glass panels that'll be on the outside like they have almost like example stuff out there it's really cool to go by and see because you can see how the glass and how the exterior of the stadium is going to look but some of those roof trusses are there and 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 the delay in the steel some of the steel that they're waiting for are those like uh what are they called l l trusses that actually connect those to the top of the roof so that's what they're waiting Uh, on but yeah a lot of that is roofing because they're going to get ready to put those on they're going to put the equipment inside and kind of build the roof from the inside uh, to the top. So it's going to be really interesting. Uh, but, yeah, oh, no, th- cool. that's what you're seeing out there. Hey, and one thing, Raider fans, if you guys want to check it out, uh, go to Mandalay, just Google Mandalay Bay Raiders camera, and they have a, a camera up on the top of Mandalay Bay just pointing at the stadium. So you can you can watch them build it anytime you want on the Internet. Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's a, and they got a bunch of different angles, and then of course the Raiders have one on their website, which is on top of Mandalay Bay. Uh, so it's really cool. Yeah, people can keep track of it. And uh, we had a, a viewer on Facebook who asked me too for a quick update on the Henderson facility. I'm going to get pictures this week for you guys and some video. Framing is up there, so they're starting to build the main building. The steel structure uh, is going up there, so it's it's on track. We don't have a completion date yet. But it's coming close. All right. We're going to step aside. When we come back, we'll close out the show. Take your calls at 702-889-5978. And we'll tie up some loose ends. You're listening to Silver and Black today here on CBS Sports Radio 1140. William Hill Sportsbook is your home for March Mania. Back again for the 2019. This is Silver and Black today, live on CBS Sports Radio 1140. Here's your host, Scott Gulbranson. All right, welcome back. We are in the home stretch, and we're going to go out now on the phone lines, and we're going to we're going up the I-15 all the way to Salt Lake City where we're going to talk to Eric, who wants to talk about the draft. Yeah. Eric, what's up, man? Oh, I'm living it. How about you guys? Oh, do, yeah, we're living the dream. Uh, we're enjoying the warmer temperatures, that's Raider, for sure. Raider fan in Utah? Yep. Uh, yeah, no, it's a good snowy day here in, in, in Salt Lake City, so wow. I'm up to go skiing. <laughs> all right. But, yeah. Uh, <laughs> hey, um, just a quick, co- a couple comments, I guess. Um, was listening to the show earlier, and and I was I found it surprising that people I don't know I love the Vontaze perfect signing. Um, been a Raider fan for a very long time, and I just hope he brings the mentality to the Raiders that they need. Just the nasty, yep. they need to be nasty. And um, I'll take a personal, I'll take a personal foul every once in a while if if he if he brings the mentality to the team that. Uh, that will carry over and, and make them play harder. I, I, that's that I love about it. Uh, that's a great point. Yeah, I think I think uh, that that uh, Eric. I think that that's what I was excited about for the organization was you get a guy and yeah, he brings some baggage with him. But sometimes that's what you need. You need somebody to give you an edge, right? And if you look at yeah. how Gruden is and how the Raiders mystique over the years and what their tradition is, I think it's a good fit. I think so too. I think so too. I, I I'm looking forward to it. I'm, uh, yeah, we'll we'll be making road trips to come and see him when they get down there in a year or so. But uh, uh, main question, I guess, just the draft. Uh, yeah. They've got to nail it. They've got to nail it. Um, uh, what do you guys think? I'm, I mean, do they hold Pat and take their three and just take best player available, or are they going to bundle up and go after Kyrie, which I don't think they should? I'd like to give uh, Derek Carr another shot at it with everybody he's got around him now. Well, we'll uh, yeah. What do you guys think? Well, we'll let I'll let Kelly go to this too, since he's our draft expert. But uh, I'll tell you, I think what Mike Mayock said towards the end of the week, he said, "What we've done in free agency is allowing us to be surgical in the draft, meaning." Yes. They can focus, but at that same point, Kelly, you can be as surgical as you want, but in the draft, you have to take the best guy that's there. If there's a great athlete, even if you have depth there, you take him, don't you? Yeah, the whole the whole part about free agency, like I've always said I would rather have the draft before free agency, um, but the reason free agency is before the draft is because if you're a smart team, you set yourself up to be able to take best player available to where you don't have glaring needs at a certain spot 
to pigeon your hole into a certain position. Um, you know, with the Raiders having so many needs, um, they're, they're, I don't want to say they're pigeonholed into a certain thing, but you know edge is something they will have to at some point have to address go after. It. Yeah. yeah. So there are certain things they have to go after, but it doesn't necessarily, it doesn't have to be at four. It doesn't have to be at 24. But, you know, trading the third, trading the fifth, you know, taking away a few, you know, that opens up. Maybe they'll trade down. Maybe they will try to get a couple more picks back that they got in the trade. Uh, but, yeah, as far as far as where they're going to go, they're pretty much – they have that open availability if they want to move up, if they want to move back, because there's enough D-line talent in this draft where yeah. if you're in the top 15, you can, get, you can get a guy who could be starting, you know, in the edge. Uh, right now, Cleveland Farrell's a name that's just falling down draft boards with the foot injury and some issues like that. I've seen some mock drafts that have him falling to the end, even to the Patriots at 32. Wow. I think there's no way he would get past Oakland at 24. But, I mean, see that, like, and that's the thing. You see names fall. You know, Ja'Kai Polite was a guy who was a top 10. Then he just blows the combine, blows his interviews. He's looked at as a third-round pro- or a yeah, third round prospect now. You know, yeah. so I mean, you're there's going to be talent out there to where they can go best available, go best fit, and they're not necessarily have to be. We have to have edge linebacker safety, have to have you know number two line, number two wide receiver. You know, they can they can open up to just you know see what falls to us. Yep. Well, and that to me is no. the, the edge. The edge, Eric, is still an issue because they haven't addressed it. So, um, no, 100%. It, 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 I mean, I think Josh Allen or Ed Oliver, I mean, is there a big drop off between the two of those? Well, two different positions. Um, I don't think you, yeah. can, I don't think you can play Ed Oliver on the edge. Um, he's a gap shooting, he's a gap shooting D tackle, which is why the fact he's fallen to 14 blows me away because he played out oh. of position at Houston way too much last year. They had him lined up right over the center, and that's just moronic because. He's a small, fast guy that's going to shoot the gaps and just get to the quarterback to where Allen's that prototypical 3-4 outside linebacker, 4-3 edge. Um, I I would prefer Allen, if if I'm drafting, to be in a 3-4 to have him off the edge because he is so good in coverage. But he's got the speed and he's got the talent where you can throw him in a 4-3, throw him on the edge, and he's just going to be a monster. Well, and, and let me let me say this, too, um, to you, Eric, is is uh, our good friend Mo Moten over at, uh, at uh, SB Nation and a couple other spots where he writes. Mo's uh, a great friend of the show. He found an old quote from Paul Gunther talking about the type of players he likes on defense. And he's he I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but he said he's, he likes to have good ends that can drop into coverage. Right, because it, it 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 allows you to show more, allows you to do more things. That's Josh Allen if he's there. So, I I think if Quinn and Williams is there, you take him at four. If Josh Allen's there, you take him at four. I mean, to me, if it's me, that's who I go with. Uh, but but the Al- Allen on the edge and being able to drop back to that versatility, I like a lot. Yep, Eric. Let me ask you a quick question. Being in Salt Lake City, I've been up there a few times. I know it's a it's a basketball city, NBA you know, state. Uh, what, what about NFL? I guess geographically it's mostly Broncos. What are you seeing up there as far as NFL fans? Uh, it, yeah, I love donkey fans. It's, it's, <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, uh, and Dallas too, but there's a, there's a fair, there's a fair Raider following here. There's a good club that meets on Sundays, watches the games. And, okay, and nice. uh, um, and, uh, but I mean, it's mostly a college. It's a U BYU town for the most part. Oh, yeah. sure. Yeah. You know, whatever. Long, long tradition but, of good college football up there at Utah and at BYU. All right, Eric, thanks for joining us, man. We're going to cut out of here. we got to leave. Thanks, Eric. Right on. All right. Uh, man, the show's over. I want to first talk about, uh, real quick, preview next week's show. Uh, who's going to be with us? Rick Villada, longtime award-winning business writer for the RJ, covers the stadium stuff. We'll talk about that with him. Also, Raiders draft and player evaluation with one of the best in the business, Emery Hunt from Football Game Plan. And Ryan Young from Yahoo Sports will join us to talk about the NFL's TV plans for you and how that might impact you and much, much more. Kelly Kreiner, happy 40th birthday. Thanks for being here. Yeah. Thanks, buddy. Chaz, as always, thanks for being here, too. Thank you, guys. All right. Pleasure. And thank all of you, most of all, for being with us today here on Silver and Black Today. Stay connected to us, silverandblacktoday.com. Check us out on Twitter, Silver Black number two day. Don't miss it. For my co-host, Kelly Kreiner, Chaz Osborne, engineer David Stepanian, we sign off, but we never say goodbye, Raider Nation. Thanks for listening. And until next week, 
as always, may the autumn wind be at your back. We'll talk to you next Sunday. Take care.